All right. So welcome, welcome everyone to our Science Thursday with Brookhaven Lab. Uh, the goal of Science Thursdays is to engage our student and education community in STEM topics by meeting Brookhaven Lab STEM professionals and learn more about their work, careers, path uh, that got them to where they are today. And the goal is at the end of the 45 minutes, uh, we hope that you have heard something that will spark your interest in a STEM career and perhaps even consider uh, being part of the Brookhaven Lab community. Good afternoon. I am Aleida Perez from the Office of Educational Programs, and I'm joined by uh, Salvador Gonzalez, who will manage the Q&A portion of today's uh, conversation. Uh, so before I introduce uh, today's guest, a few reminders. Uh, you're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A chat section that is at the bottom uh, of your um, Zoom app. And we will, try to make, uh, to, we will try to get as many questions as we can today. And if you have any issues or difficulties with the audio, uh, audio uh, stream, uh, you can let uh, George, uh, is our IT support, uh, let him know by, uh, by uh, putting a comment in the chat section. Uh, so before we uh, begin, um, we're gonna put a quick poll out just to see how many people are watching uh, this event with you today. You got about 30 seconds to, to answer that poll. Okay. Thank you, George, for putting that together. Okay. So today uh, I am joined by Piyush Yoshi. He's a research engineer at the Super Superconducting Magnet Division here at Brookhaven Lab. And Piyush will share his work at the magnet division and the career path um, that got him to where he's um, today. So uh, welcome Piyush, it, it is a true pleasure having you today. And I think I'm looking forward to our conversation. When you and I were talking about, uh, we, you know, one of the questions that I ask you is how long have you been at Brookhaven Lab? So how long have you been here? Because it's been a while, it's for some time. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, but uh, let me thank you for inviting me here and uh, talk to the young uh, budding scientists and engineers whom I'm going to see in future here at the lab. So I've been at the lab for 34 years. Yes. I joined as a research engineer in 1988, soon after I graduated from NYU engineering school. But I'm kind of a young guy here. I mean, it's not <laughs> unusual to see people who have worked here for 40, 45 years. Just two rooms down the corridor, uh, there's office of Dr. Bill Sampson. 60 mm -hmm. years at the Brookhaven National Lab. I was not even born when he joined. Yeah. So people who work at the lab have a long career because it's so interesting. Uh, believe me, once you get into the lab and do this kind of work, it's so interesting. You never want to leave, right? You never want to leave. It's very satisfying. I think mm -hmm. this is one of the best things I did to myself. If someone asks me what you want to do again in your next life, come to Brookfield National <laughs> Lab. That's good to hear. So, so I think one of the the I think one of, when you and I were talking, one one of the you know hidden goals is to encourage you new generation, right? Because at some point somebody has to come and continue yeah, yeah, the work yeah. that you and others are doing at this at the mag at the superconducting magnet division here at Brookhaven Lab. So not so just to lead into the next into the, into the conversation, I'm pretty sure that our audience is not aware that the magnet division has been at Brookhaven Lab for as long as the lab have existed. Uh, right. So I, I know because I, I talk to students and, and, and community and, and not aware that that is he that you know that that is that is here. So can you tell us what is what what the super what is the superconducting mining division? What is the mission and what kind of research goes on at, in your group in, in your in your division at, at the magnet? Absolutely mm -hmm. right. So magnet division, as you said, has been at the Brookhaven lab for a long long time. So in 1950s, uh, Brooklyn built a very first accelerator called Cosmotron, right in this building where I'm sitting in building 902. Uh, a lot of people 
were developing magnets, but they were not superconducting magnets. They were normal copper wine magnets. So over years, physicists kept exploring the matter and they wanted more and more powerful magnet to explore more and more deeper and deeper inside to the atom. To smash the atom, we need more powerful magnets. So they came up with this idea of superconducting magnets. And then around 1960s and 70s, uh, superconductivity started really gaining the momentum and people started building the magnets of superconducting material. And that's when the superconducting magnet division was established in the late 70s uh, to do the research on particle accelerator magnets, especially for uh, uh, magnets at the Fermi lab for, for, uh, in the European laboratories, at the superconducting supercollider in Texas, and also a particle accelerator at the Brookhaven National Labs. Mm -hmm. So this uh, division has been here for a long time. If we, in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a Dr. P uh, Peter Wander who retired. He was here for another 45, 50 years and he was one of the old guy who started this whole uh, superconducting uh, magnet divisions, yeah. So you 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 build these magnets that are used in various you know, not just at BNL, but other places too, that are used for this to support the accelerator sciences that right. we that we do. So, for some of us that may not know, what is a superconducting magnet? Sure. Okay. So uh, let me take uh, help of a slide here, uh, and I mm. can show you exactly. So, what is a superconducting magnet? Because uh, they are not your typical refrigerator magnet. Just correct. Like, right. Correct. So. You'll be amazed at the shape and size of the magnets, which I'm <laughs> about to show you. Mm -hmm. So let me share the slides here. Sure. Yes, we can see them. So, uh, so superconductor looks very much like a copper wire, but it's made not of copper, but it's made of some alloy called niobium titanium or niobium tin or magnesium diboroid. They are different alloys who become superconductor at different temperature. So uh, why they are called superconductor? From high school physics, we all know what is a conductor, right? Uh, when you take a piece of copper wire, uh, and you pass a current through it, it sees some resistance. And the resistance limits the amount of current you can pass through a copper wire. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you take a thin wire and try to pass 10 ampere through it, it will burn like a fuse, right? But superconductor is a material when it has extremely cold temperature becomes, has zero resistance. So you can theoretically pass long, uh, I mean, infinite amount of current through it. So a wire as thin as this, as I can show you in a picture here, a very small wire, which is a little a flat cable here, which is in my hand, that can carry up to 5,000 amp mm. as compared to just 200 amps into the cable, which is up, up here, which is normally used in your household wiring. When you look at the electrical panel in your house, you will see this kind of cables, which brings about 200 amp from the transformer on, on the road into your house. To make a magnet out of copper wire like this, it will be very difficult. If you try to make a very powerful magnet out of this kind of copper wire, it will be of size of a building. <laughs> While this, if you make a magnet with a small little conductor like that, it can stay in a, within a room, actually. I'll show you the next uh, pictures, uh, how it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the only, problem here is that this little cable, which is uh, very small, about uh, one, uh, 10 millimeter wide and one millimeter thick, it needs to be at a very cold temperature. I mean, extremely, extremely cold, which is minus 268 Celsius. In Fahrenheit, we call it 4.5 Kelvin, where zero mm -hmm. Kelvin is absolute zero, right? So that is the only condition we need to satisfy. If we can cool this material to 4.5 Kelvin, then it becomes superconductor. And then we can use it to wind the magnet of any length or any power we want. We can put 1,000, 10,000, 5,000 amps into it and create a very, very powerful magnet, which we need for uh, uh, particle colliders. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And what kind of cooling material, what kind of cooling system do you use to really, you know, bring these temperatures yeah. down? So, uh, mm -hmm. this, this temperature, uh, 4.5 Kelvin, is normally achieved when we have a liquid helium. So liquid helium boils at, boils at around 4.5 Kelvin. The liquid nitrogen, where a lot of people must have seen in the laboratory, boils around mm -hmm. 77 Kelvin. So all these material, they need to go down to almost 77 Kelvin or sometimes even to 4.5 Kelvin to become superconductor. But once they become superconductor, they do the amazing job for us. They take a high, a large amount of current uh, and uh, no, no resistance. That's why mm -hmm. there is no heat generated. There is no energy wastage. So maybe from uh, looking at this little uh, illustration here from high school physics, we all know to make an electromagnet, you take a little copper wire and wrap it around a nail or some kind of iron piece and connect it to a battery and you get a magnet, right? Suppose I want to make a very big magnet. I cannot just wrap a big ca cable like this around an iron to make a big magnet because it will be very difficult to wrap it like this, right? So that's why we use some something like this very thin cable to mm -hmm. make an electromagnet. So, uh, let, let, yeah. so before you go, there's a question in the chat I think it's relevant to be asking. It's asking, what happens if you, if you super cool a regular copper wire, does it become more conductive? Ah, good question, right. Mm -hmm. So when you super cool any material, it gets better conductor but does not become superconductor. Superconductor means absolute zero resistance. Mm -hmm. When you supercool or when you bring the copper wire down to 4.5 Kelvin, it will become much better conductor, 10 times better than what it was at room temperature, but not superconductor. Thank so you. Still there will great. be limitation on in how much am amount of current you can pass through it. And as you know, the magnet, the strength of magnet is dependent on the amount of current you pass through it and number Correct. of turns around it, right? So, but so so I would, I was my next question to ask, uh, you know, to follow what you're saying. So, the magnets that you build at the super uh, at the magnets that you build and the superconducting magnet division, how there what is the strength of these magnets? Because they have a job to do when it comes to an accelerator. Right. right, right. So let me go to the next slide. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's uh, look at this again, the illustration which I have here, the small electromagnet you can make at home using a small battery will produce a magnetic field, something in micro Tesla, right? The earth's magnetic field is somewhere around tens of micro Tesla. Mm -hmm. What we need in accelerator is almost like a 10 Tesla. There's what is a Tesla, uh, Pijus, Tesla for people okay. that- Tesla mm -hmm. is a unit to measure magnetic field strength. Okay. Okay, so when you say, okay, what is the magnetic field of the earth? I'll say five Gauss or 0 0.00005 Tesla, okay? Mm -hmm. Something, uh, this is unit how we measure the uh, uh, strength of magnetic field. So we are right now trying to aim uh, or trying to build the magnet which are in range of 10 to 15 Tesla. This is the amount of uh, field we require to do the very big accelerator or to get these uh, high luminosity, accelerator build and do the atom smashing. For example, uh, you, you see here, we have a permanent magnet and we have electromagnet. So superconducting magnet is an electromagnet. So here, for again, most of the students know about this magnetic line of forces here. So uh, in this kind of horseshoe magnet, you have this kind of line of forces going from north to south. Again, in the bar magnet, you have lines of forces going from north to south. Same thing, you can wind a superconducting magnet, which is yeah, this one, where you can have the magnetic line of forces going up and down. So, mm -hmm. and this is the, actually, once you wind this magnet and put it into case, this is how it's going to look. It's almost like 15 meter long. One of, this is one of the typical oh, magnet cool. um, in one of the LHC, large hadron collider we are making for, uh, uh, a European accelerator. So uh, just going a little bit into physics, if you inject a particle into the center of the beam here, a center, a center of the tube here, because of magnetic field, it will experience a force, bending force towards the center, uh, towards the radius of the circle. So if you string all these kind of magnets together in a circular uh, fashion, 
the particle which is injected here will follow a circular pattern. And that's how you get a circular collider. So I think there was a talk on this uh, program about the particle uh, accelerator itself, right? Yeah. So once you have a two rings of this kind of superconducting magnet in which the particle goes one in clockwise direction, one in counterclockwise direction, and at a certain point, they come together and collide. And when you collide, what you see is uh, the subatomic particle or uh, particles within the nucleus of an atom is uh, sprayed all over the place and you can capture them and study them. So that's the whole function of uh, superconducting magnet. These you would so, not be able to do with normal magnets like with the copper wire. So PG, just to because I understand, so the, the, the magnet step is, it steers that particle making sure that it goes into that circular motion. Right. Otherwise, right. you know, it would be shooting straight, right? Right, right. <laughs> All right. the time. So cool. yeah, look, uh, so this is a picture of, okay, this is a picture of one of the Rick magnet. It's almost like- Is uh, that you uh, on the picture? Uh, that's me, yeah. This is sitting right <laughs> at the outside of our building in building 902. And this is a picture of the uh, this uh, magnet strung together in a circular uh, ring inside the mm -hmm. Rick ring. And these are uh, similar magnets in uh, at uh, Large Hadron Collider near Swiss in Switzerland, right? These are sun magnets inside these internal. And here, this is in the aerial picture of Brookhaven Lab. You can see uh, this is the Rick ring here, which houses all these magnets in a uh, almost three mile circumference uh, circle, where uh, a particle accelerates and uh, they collide at six o'clock and eight o'clock detection halls to find out what's inside the nucleus. Very, very cool. So um, I know, go ahead, because we were talking about the, the yeah, you know, so, what, is, so, what is RIC, right? right? Right, so why build particle accelerator and what is RIC and what is CERN and why there are so many particle accelerators in the world? So there's a question we always had from right from the beginning of the mankind, everyone wants to know what is universe and what is the matter and all these to answer all these scientific questions. Uh, we have always tried to explore what is in the atom, right? Atom is the most building, fundamental building block of a matter in, in the universe. So in, in fact, the students in high school, they also study a lot about atoms. Uh, and they know that it, in the nucleus of an atom, we have particles called neutrons and protons. But very few people know that what is inside the proton. So nowadays we want to go deep inside the proton and find out what are inside the proton, what are the subprotonic particles, what are the particles inside the nucleus of an uh, atom. So, so far we know that inside a proton, there are three quarks and uh, three gluons. So something like these. So this blue, green, and red ball, which you see here, are cartoon for the quarks. And this thing-like structure are the things which hold them together called gluons. So we need to explore more and get deeper into this characteristic of quarks and gluons. And that's why we are building a next generation of particle accelerator called electron ion collider or high velocity large hadron collider in Switzerland. And uh, right now, we are busy, basically involved in research and development of those powerful magnets more than what we have in a rig they'll be three or four times more powerful than what the hmm. rig magnets are right that's very cool and you if i heard you correctly that's for the uh the eic of or the electron ion collider or for the uh, the large hadron collider so uh, right now we are doing uh two research programs we have one is for eic and also one from electro, uh, large hadron collider hmm. both so okay. magnet division has uh, multiple. We also do a lot of research for KEK, which is Japanese accelerator, also in some mm -hmm. German accelerators, right? Very cool. Yeah, it's good. We have it's, it's a it's wide a, footprint, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, I agree. With, I was just about the same thing, the same as a, as a wide footprint and able to support various research groups, you know, research, uh, very different kind of science, right? In terms of the, the, by providing this very, Unique magnet tools that are very important in 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 the science and the in the in the tools that are used to, to understand the sciences as That's well. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So so one thing that you and I talked about is that you've been in, as you mentioned earlier you are in you are in the magnet you have been in the in the magnet division for a long for thirty plus years. So what is your specific role? What you what is it that you group 
does uh, the focus of your group at the magnet division? Good question. So in a magnet division, uh, there are people who design the magnet, uh, study the electromagnetic field, because when you want to make a magnet for particle accelerator, you need a very precise and very uniform magnetic field so that particle can go in the directory or trajectory as we design, right? So people who compute the magnetic field, then there are people who will assemble the magnet so that it produces that kind of field. Then there are people who taste the magnet to make sure that the magnet is designed as per requirements. Mm -hmm. So I'm mostly involved in testing those magnets and making them cold, right? The main thing I told you was to make the magnet as at 4.5 Kelvin, which is not an easy to, to cool this such a big material or such a big piece of metal uh, down to 4.5 Kelvin, you require, sometimes we even go below 4.5 Kelvin, we oh, go wow. to as low as 1.8 Kelvin. So all these engineering work or all the process which is required to make a liquid helium and mm -hmm. introduce liquid helium into the magnet, cool the magnet, because when we cool the magnet, this whole magnet actually shrinks. So you have to be careful of uh, all the joints you make, all the material you use, all uh, all the, what you call as a casing which you use and things and how to insulate this magnet from not losing all the heat outside, right? So yeah. it stays cold. So all those uh, engineering part or all the, uh, what do you call the workshops which you have here. So I take care of all these things and I make sure that magnet is tested as per the specification without destroying the magnet. Otherwise there's Correct. something called as a quench in the magnet. So once, if you are putting like 10,000 amps into a magnet and magnet comes out of superconducting state, it's called quenching okay. and it will destroy itself. And those kind of accidents yep. have happened, right? To protect this magnet is very important. So my main job is to protect the magnet while testing. Is that similar what happened at the Light Hadron Collider a few years back yeah, when they had that, <laughs> that <laughs> when they have the this, uh, superconducting problem. magnet? Yes. yes so they had a joint so that means that the magnet lost its cool and no longer yeah. that cold and we have a little issue. Correct. And yeah. they, they can they can really break a very expensive machine. Oh yeah, uh, in the process, quite a uh, quite, uh, violent explosion. They can break the magnet uh, metals and bolts and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I think that's actually very very exciting. Um, Piyush, you and I were talking about you know super. We talk about think about superconducting magnets and we put them in the context of accelerators because this is the the, the science the the science that we do here at Brookhaven Lab and other national labs and, you know, and, and collaborators abroad. But what other applications besides accelerators, superconducting magnets have? Why, why people should think about, care about them? Yeah, uh, that's another one good, very good question here. So I have a slide here which shows other applications of superconducting magnets. Mm -hmm. And now the applications of superconducting magnets are actually increasing day by day. Uh, we all know what is the environmental issues we are facing right now, right? The clean energy. Mm. And superconducting magnet technology can help us very well uh, to get to achieve that kind of clean, uh, clean energy sources, right? So most of the, our transport system is using hydrocarbon, the fuel, right? The gasoline and petrol. And so right now, in Japan and China and Germany, they are experimenting with the maglev train. A lot of people must have used the maglev train. So maglev train has a magnetic levity train has superconducting magnets in, underneath the car and on the track. And mm -hmm. there's a repulsive force between, magnetic repulsive force between the car and the track. And they actually the car floats onto the track without touching the track. And then since there is no friction, it can go with a very high velocity with very low energy so this is very good. Uh, and this concept was born at Brookhaven National Lab, MagLab, and we also have the MagLab contest every year here, right? Yeah. Okay. So one of the main, uh, another application is very interesting application is an MRI machine. A lot of people don't know that the big donut which you see here is a superconducting magnet here. So MRI machines have, have superconducting magnet. We also had a research, uh, a little group here at Brookhaven Lab doing research on MRI magnets. Hmm. In fact, the present head of our magnet superconductive magnet division is an expert on MRI magnet, Dr. Oh, cool. Kathleen M. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I was telling you, apart from these uh, 
uh, transportation and medical systems, uh, the big future for the superconducting magnet is in a fusion reactor. So mm -hmm. this is a picture of the fusion reactor here. And these are the huge superconducting coils, the D-shaped coils, which you see here, well, uh, a person can stand within the coils. These are those big coils. So the fusion reactors are almost like a limitless source of energy. If you are able to achieve a fusion reactor on the earth, probably it's like a creating a mini sun on the earth. And uh, right now, a lot of research is being done into fusion reactor. And in fact, we are collaborating with a few of the fusion reactor, fusion research people to provide them and guide them with the superconducting magnets. Is that related to when you and I were talking about, is that something that is applicable to aerospace engine, in, engines too, or, or is that something different? Yeah. No, this is different. These fusion reactors are almost are like for energy generation, right? The fusion of uh, mm -hmm. hydrogen into helium to produce energy. Right? Energy, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, superconducting magnets in different shape and size can also be used for superconducting wind turbines. Right? Mm -hmm. Superconducting motors uh, for the propulsion of the ship and aircraft. So we want to stay away from all the hydrocarbon, uh, like aircraft. We use a lot of uh, hydrocarbon to just run their jet engines. If we replace jet engines by electric motors, and then energy can be stored into the plane using battery or some other um, energy storage system, then the whole aircraft can be just electric aircraft without uh, even polluting anything. So. Mm -hmm. I find it very cool. I yeah. find it very cool because um, it's actually, you know, the, the the possibilities, right? And you and I were talking about spaceship, the, you know, the, the, in space travel space and launches and all those space things. launches and all that, right? It's it's the, the possibilities of being able to do that in somewhat of a carbon-free way. It's it's very it's, it's I think it's exciting. It's exciting. Yep, yep. So if you're welcome, you can put any questions on the chat. Um, I think we're going to kind of pivot into, into your career path a sure. little bit. Yeah, and, yeah. So, um, and so I know that there are students listening and watching us. So do you always want to be an engineer? Do you always wanted to pursue a STEM career? Or is it something like, you know, happens? What was the well, path to that? Yeah, so... Uh, so engineering runs in my family. My father was also an engineer, so it was obvious. And I used to have, I worked with him and he used to teach me to do a lot of hands-on work in the house, repairing, carpentry kind of stuff. He was also electrical engineer, so I learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. But the key, uh, key, the flashpoint was here in 1969, I had an opportunity to meet Neil Armstrong, you know, the first man on the moon. That was, uh, in fact, the, the crew of Apollo 11 was visiting our city. And then I yeah. happened to meet him. And that was really, because imagining putting a man on the moon in 1969 without any computers. I mean, they, everything was done with the slide rules, you know? And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> paper and pencil, you know, no computers that time. Uh, so it was really a great engineering feat. You know? But that's so got you... in engineering, yeah. That got you interested in engineering. So you did your engineering degree in in India, correct? Yeah, I did my undergraduate in India, mm -hmm. and then I came as a graduate student in uh, USA. I was at New York University School of Engineering, where I did my thesis on electromagnetic launchers, which are very similar to elect um, these particle accelerators. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at that time, uh, the RIC project was coming up. SSC and RIC projects were coming up, and they were looking for young engineers to work on a particle accelerators and superconducting magnets. And okay. that's how I got into the BNL, Brooklyn National Lab. And it that, never left. It never left, right. And never, never left, never left. Um, uh, so that, you know, so you came here right after after your, did you do a postdoc, Pijuj, or that was just stay after, after you graduated? No, school, I just, just came, I didn't come as a postdoc. I just got an employment mm -hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, if there are any students, are you? Do you want to stop sharing the screen so we can put both of us sure, on the? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so if there are any um, students that are listening, what if a student wants to follow a similar career or a STEM path, uh, similar career 
as you are similar STEM careers, your what kind of courses or uh, preparation you will recommend a student pursue other than high school to prepare them for college or in college to prepare them for that next step in their journey? Well, uh, in school and high school and even to the college, I was very interested in physics, right? So, uh, of course, uh, physics and math, uh, a lot of people try to shy away from it, but it's not mm -hmm. that once you understand and go to the to the fundamentals of it. I used to read a lot of fiction, uh, science fiction <laughs> yes. books, right? <laughs> My famous uh, author was George Gamow, you know, and uh, Isaac Asimov, and they say, mm -hmm. yeah, those are the great people who triggered my thoughts, right? So of course, math, physics are good subjects to take, but also I would say, uh, these are tough subjects also, but you should also take some few subjects which uh, you enjoy, you know, in high school, along with math and physics, also you can take a, a fine arts, music and things yes. like that's what I did, right? Apart from those subjects, I used to do a lot of music. And uh, oh. uh, yeah, of course, I also love drawing and painting and arts and photography and all those things. So. Yeah, I think that's important you mentioned. I think it, it makes us very well-rounded people uh you know overall yeah just even a little a bit hobby, of everything. right you need, you need hobby. a hobby <laughs> right. you need a hobby and if your hobby matches your attitude and aptitude for engineering probably is best uh, you should do a lot of modeling right uh, small airplane models and rocket models and hovercrafts and all those things right so do you have to do a lot of uh coding uh as i don't did you do a lot of co coding as an undergrad or and yeah. I still do a lot of coding. And so, so coding is part of what engineers right, right. have to yeah. As an engineering, mm. uh, it's uh, one of the must to have uh, learn good lang uh, one or two languages and use it. Because now everything is automated, right? Mm -hmm. You need to write a program to automate everything. You just don't sit and go down and do everything with hand, right? And these machines, they run 24-7. So mm -hmm. you need to program them. You need to analyze the data which it comes out. And you need to write a uh, very efficient programs to otherwise you are never able to cope up with this kind of uh, work. Also, you you mentioned that you 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 play music or you listen to music. So did you play an instrument by any chance? Yeah, I play I play instrument. Uh, I play drums. I play harmonium. Uh, sometimes I play sitar. Yeah. Oh wow! So we know that. That's uh, the next BNL talent show, um, PJ. Oh, yeah. Maybe the, the mentor, the mentor talent show. This is what we're going to he hear next, probably this, probably sure. this summer. Sure. Um, uh, going back to um, to the coding piece, what computer language most engineers use? Is I know physicists like Python for the most part. So is that yeah, something yeah. that Python, engineers? C plus during my time, there was also Visual Basics, uh, Visual C. Uh, Python is now very popular. Before my generation, it was Fortran. Oh, like I remember from this. Yeah. I, I, I am I am dating myself, but yes, I do remember yeah. uh, hearing about something called Fortran uh, back in my days too. I know that you have been a, how, did you do, I, I guess as an undergraduate, I don't know if you had the opportunity to do internships while you were in, in India. Uh, yes, uh, so did? our education system was called a sandwich system. So mm -hmm. like first six semesters, you stay at university and then you go one semester out in the industry, then come back and then do another one semester uh, at the university and then again go out and do one semester in the industry and then come back. So so that, that gave us a good exposure to what yes. actually you want to zero in on. Because electrical engineering itself is very vast, right? There's electronic, there's power electronics, power transmission. Then there's a, a computer science also is part of uh, electrical engineering. Yeah, um, so is, internships are very important. Like as you mentioned, yeah. they give you exposure and it also gives you yeah. a sense of, uh, you know, not just exposure connections and kind of figure it out where you're going to go next yeah, if, yeah, if that were to be. Yes. If, the big part of, of that. I know that you have been, and, and I just, for the people that are listening, you know, Brookhaven has a high school research program, yep. which is an, a, a good way for high school students to start exploring uh, a field like electrical engineering, but also the Department of Energy hosts the college internship program, which we have two, one for 
for your college students called Science Undergraduate Laboratory Internship. And we also we have one for community college students, the community college internship. And those are very valuable ways to um, get your food in the field and trying to figure it's hard to kind of figure it out what is out there and whether you like it. I mean, that's I just being kind of blunt on that. And I know you have been a mentor because I know you have been a mentor for our college students, yep. for our high school students over many, many, many years. Okay. Yep. And so can how important is has that been for you in terms of being a mentor? To to, uh, to others and and the and the role that that has in the development of the next generation of STEM professionals. I mean, I love mentoring because uh, see uh, we have so much experience and knowledge gain over, and we need to pass it on. And this is a ongoing process from generation mm -hmm. to generation. We need to pass it on, right? And especially this kind of knowledge, you don't get out into the schools or colleges, like working with superconducting magnets and this kind of particle accelerators and all those things. So I do like people to, or students to come here as a part of SULI program, as you say, or CCI, a community college internship, even high school research. We can uh, work with all kinds of students at a very fundamental level also. And in fact, for me, it's almost 40 years since I went to school, right? So I want to learn from them also, the new way yeah. of learning. In fact, they are a lot more smarter than what I was in the <laughs> college. But, so, and uh, the questions they ask are really amazing. I mean, it really keeps us thinking, it triggers our thought process also. So mentoring is very important. That's one of the process uh, I really would like to do. And, uh, and, and in fact, Brookham Lab has very good opportunity for this mentorship and is doing a great mm -hmm. job. And in fact, uh, I remember at least four or five of students who have mentored have actually joined in Brooklyn Lab and doing great that's, work right now. Yeah. That's actually very, very important. I always look said. forward for the summer interns to come to the lab. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to hold you to that, Piyush. Uh, yeah, uh, but you, but uh, they're, they're, um, yeah, the, the importance of the, 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 the making the connections, right? And and the and so that can lead to us, you know, employment at, at here or elsewhere. Yeah, and that's yeah. something that is that is very very cool. Right, right. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Um, so as as we as we closing up uh, here, Peter, and I don't see and unless there are any more questions coming through, mm. uh, if we you know our audience here. May not re doesn't remember anything that you have said. Uh, what what three points you want to give them as a final advice to the audience? And three important take home messages that you want to share with them. Well, the academically or just looking at the technology, uh, we are in a great danger right now environmentally. Right, so mm -hmm. I want everybody to think of the environment, how to improve, and how to reduce this uh, carbon footprint and superconducting magnets are going to be great help uh, in doing this thing. So at least if they want to think that way, they can help the whole universe by getting into science and technology and help towards the clean energy thing. Second thing is also uh, for a student, of course, you take some tough questions, uh, some tough uh, subjects while school uh, in physics and math and also but as I just said, uh, don't be stressed out, right? Do something yes. which is fun to you. Always, I always had a part, uh, at least half an hour of one hour of a day where I did my thing, which I really made me very happy, you know? Mm -hmm. So to be happy, I see there's no a sense of living life when you're not happy, right? The life is all about happiness. So I tell mm -hmm. you, you have to be one happy soul. And then only you can work very well. Once you're happy, you can make other people happy and do very productive work, right? Yes. So I would definitely say keep uh, these two tracks together. Do your hobby. Have some nice uh, uh, hobby to keep you relieved, relaxed. And at the same time, uh, do uh, this tough uh, work on science and technology, right? Uh, science and math. And, and be persistent, right? You cannot mm -hmm. just go for half an hour and do something. Once you take, establish a goal early in the life. I think every student will have some kind of goal as soon as they graduate from high school and then, mm -hmm. then be persistent in pursuing that goal right and i like what you said be persistent right 
not to do it do that this is a, a marathon not a, a yeah yeah a, um a, you know a hundred yeah, you, dash. you have to be a horse <laughs> of a long race so not like <laughs> right? life is long right you have to work yeah. for 50, 60 years right Exactly. So persistent and patience, I think, too. That's like, I like I, I like that, that that like very, very, very much. So I think that's all we have for today, Piyush. It, it has been a wonderful conversation. I am glad that we are able to share with folks about the superconducting magnet division, why what you do, what the group does, and 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 I think it's. Uh, I hope that this was uh, 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 informative and enlightening to our to our audience, and and that that few of them decide to to you know to continue to be the next generation that we need them. moves on because <laughs> yeah. we need them because we need them. Thank yes. you. It has been a total pressure a pleasure uh, talking to you today. Uh, you. Just for our viewers, just make our next Science Thursday is May nineteen at four p.m. Make, please, please make sure to tune in to that. Uh, we would like to say thank you to Brookhaven National Laboratory, uh, which Brookhaven National Laboratory for hosting this event today. And I encourage you to check our programs. Uh, Sally, if you can drop the uh, Office of Educational Program website and check out our opportunities for college internships for, and high school opportunities uh, on our website. Uh, thank you. Stay safe and see you next time. Thank you, Piyush. Thank you. Thank you.